Well, hello again. Welcome to Horror in Detail. Today we are going to share Wendigo and Skinwalker encounter stories. First story. This story was shared by you slash 19RT98 so credits to him. I never should have said it. Never make a decision over drinks. If I had been sober, if we all had been sober, maybe we never would have agreed to go to the cabin. We would have never been there and I would have never. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Our fateful decision was made on a Friday night in a packed Mexican restaurant. It was the first time that our friend group had all been in one place since high school graduation seven years earlier. There were seven of us, Megan, Ember, Ricky, Ella, Margaret, Kenny, and me. Most of us had grown distant, following different paths Megan and Ember, my closest friends, were the only people who I had seen with regularity over the years. We were a lively bunch at the restaurant. After a period of hugs, how are yous, and several baskets of chips, we had finally come to a natural lull in the conversation. This was all Megan needed to speak up. So, I have an idea. It's kind of crazy, so promise to hear me out first. She paused, looking at all our reactions. To those who didn't know her as well as I did, she looked innocent with her wide eyes and smile. I knew this innocent act very well, just as I also knew she was about to get her way. I covered my smile with a sip of my mark. Okay, Margaret trailed off, glancing at Kenny. Ella and Ricky also exchanged looks, trying to gauge what was about to happen. Ember and I remained silent. Okay, so we're all home for the weekend right? She looked around, imploring everyone to answer. There were nods of agreement around the table. Megan beamed. Excellent. Okay, so here's my idea. She paused again for dramatic effect. Out of the corner of my eyes I saw Kenny rolling her eyes. I don't want this to be the only thing we do this weekend. We haven't seen each other in forever. We really need to make this weekend count. No one said anything, waiting for her to continue. Feeling loose from the alcohol and in the name of support, I chimed in. What do you suggest? I asked. Megan tossed her hair over her shoulder. Let's rent a cabin for tomorrow night. Everyone froze, unsure of what to say or do. I was surprised as well. She hadn't said anything about a cabin on the ride over here. I tried to make eye contact with Ember to see if she had been forewarned. Ember looked just as puzzled as the rest of us. A cabin? Ella questioned. Could we even find one this close to when we want to leave? And one that's affordable? Ricky chimed in, twisting a dark curl around her finger absent-mindedly. Some of us are broke. My eyes darted over to Megan. I was fully expecting her to be annoyed, but she looked serene. As if she had expected these questions, and embraced them. Well, I actually did some looking earlier, and there is a place. She smirked. She was very confident, and it was odd. Of course I didn't want her to be upset, but I could tell this was different. There was no part of her that thought we'd say no. My curiosity was piqued. Megan pulled out her phone and after a myriad of tapping noises, began reading. Safe haven cabins, peace, refuge, and relaxation. It sleeps eight, has three bedrooms and bathrooms, a pull-out couch, Wi-Fi, smart TVs, a grill, a fire pit, and a hot tub. She grinned. No one really seemed moved by the hot tub revelation, much to Megan's annoyance. Come on guys, just imagine it. There are woods all around it, 
and no neighbors for miles. We can literally be as loud and obnoxious as we want. And we have a hot tub, hello. Megan picked up her margarita. Imagine relaxing in the hot water, drinking a couple of these, and listening to the relaxing sounds of nature. We deserve a relaxing weekend. I could tell that she was softening everyone up. I could already picture myself in the hot tub, and wonders the jets might do on my knotted muscles. Okay, but how much is it? Ember asked. And how did you even find this place? Megan seemed like she was glowing. I knew this would be the kicker. It's completely free. She smirked. Free. Kenny asked, snottily. How can that cabin possibly be free? Megan's smile turned sharp. I was getting there. She said icily. My co-worker and her family rented it out for the week, but sadly they're going to have to leave tomorrow morning. Some emergency came up. She didn't want the extra night to go to waste, she she asked if I wanted to take some friends up there to enjoy it for the night. As long as we leave at 11 on Sunday and follow all the leaving instructions, the owner will never know. Megan passed her phone around, letting us swipe through the pictures of the cabin her co-worker sent her. It was charming, wooden and rustic. It certainly looked secluded and private. The amenities were all new and it certainly looked spacious enough for the seven of us. I couldn't find a fault with it. I could tell everyone was on board now, as the phone was passed around. Even Kenny who always had something to say, had nothing to comment. All we'll have to pay for is the gas to get there and whatever food and drinks we want to bring. Megan looked at everyone's faces, trying to make eye contact with everyone. A tactic she learned in business school to close a deal. So are you guys in? She asked, as she sat her phone back down. Megan picked up her marg and held it in the center of the table. Rachel? She asked me, begging me to back her up with her eyes. My veins buzzed with alcohol, and I scrambled to come up with any reason why it wouldn't work out. I could think of nothing. I think it sounds like an amazing deal. I'd be down. I said, trying to signal Ember to agree with my eyes. I took my own marg and held it next to Megan's. Yeah I'd be down too. Ember agreed, clinking her glass with ours. Slowly, everyone else's margaritas appeared in the circle. Megan looked like a kid on Christmas. Cheers. She beamed. I ignored the slight twisting in my gut that maybe something wasn't right as we all drank. It was probably just the alcohol settling. As it turned out, the cabin was a pretty good distance away from us. Our group piled into two cars, mine and Ella's. I took Megan and Ember in the coolers, while Ella took Ricky, Margaret, and Kenny in her larger car. The drive was mostly interstate until we were an hour away. The roads twisted through the mountains. They were flanked with beautiful orange and red trees. Discarded leaves danced in the wind as we drove by. It was an idyllic fall scene, filled with golden sunlight. The car thermometer showed 60 degrees. A good omen. The car had naturally grown quiet after the first hour of the trip, and to fill the silence, Megan had put on a podcast. The three of us had always been interested in the supernatural, and there was nothing like some spooky stories to get us in the mood. The calming voices combined with the gentle motion of the car had been all it took for Ember and Megan to fall asleep. I was the only one listening when the episode changed. It was an episode where people submitted their own stories and experiences. The first few were interesting enough, but it was the third that piqued my interest. 
The woman in the story detailed her experience during a cabin trip. A very strange but not unwelcome coincidence. It had started like all typical cabin trips do, with settling in and unpacking and assigning rooms. Their trip was normal until the woman went outside that night. She was throwing away the garbage when she heard it. Her friend's voice from the tree line urging her to come help. She had frozen, sure that her friend was inside at the table. She called for her friend but all she got in response was the same plea for help. The silence of the night had grown oppressive around her. She strained to even hear an insect. It begged her for help again. She peeked through the back door, to confirm her suspicions. And sure enough there her friend sat playing cards with the rest of them. The woman ran back inside and told her friends what she had experienced. They had laughed at her for being spooked and maybe overhearing their conversation through the walls. But the woman knew it was something else. She called it a wendigo. A wendigo is like super dangerous. One of the podcasters said. I would literally be so freaked. Oh my god, Kate, we're not supposed to say the name. That literally summons them. The podcaster, Kate, gasped and made a show of freaking out. Oh my god I feel like it's watching me now. They soon moved on to the next story, but my skin was crawling. There was a tug in my gut as I looked at the woods we were driving through. They were dense, thick. Who knows what could be hiding in them. The car hit a large hole in the road and jerked me out of my reverie. I was being absolutely ridiculous. There were no such thing as a wendigo. The woman probably made up that story just so they'd read it. Everything would be fine. The cabin looked exactly like the pictures. It was charming and spacious, and Megan's co-worker had left it in pristine order. We made quick work of setting up and deciding rooms. Megan and I decided to share a room, Ember would take the twin upstairs, Kenny and Margaret would share the other room, and Ricky and Ella would take the pull-out couch. With that settled, we did what all young women alone in a cabin do, and started to drink. Ella brought things to grill, and Megan and I began to prepare the other side dishes. Kenny took the liberty of setting up the speakers, and we were in full party mode in a matter of minutes. Everything was fine until we decided to go out to the hot tub. It was located on the back porch, facing the woods. I settled into the water, my heart thumped as I recalled the podcast. Would I too hear a Wendigo's voice calling to me? Would it be Megan or Ember begging for help? I tried to recall what I had seen about Wendigo's before. I knew they were supposed to be thin, perpetually starving, perpetually dying. My imagination was running wild, so wild that I couldn't settle into the flow of conversation. Rachel? Megan asked, flicking water in my direction. Yes. I whipped my head around. I hadn't even noticed I was staring into the woods. You okay over there? She asked. She was teasing me, but I could tell she was concerned. She always spooked easy, and I could tell I was making her nervous staring off into the woods. I wanted to put her at ease, and to do so, I made the stupidest decision of my life. I told them about the woman's story. I'm fine. I laughed. I was just remembering one of the stories on the podcast we listened to on the way up here. This woman claimed she had an encounter with a wendigo while staying in a cabin in the woods. It like mimicked the voice of her friend inside. I was just on the lookout. I said with a wink, trying to play off my fear. After all, it was completely ridiculous. Oh my god you can't actually believe that can you? Kenny asked, snorting. 
What the hell is a Wendigo anyway? I think I saw a movie about one once. Ella chimed in. It was some huge monster thing. It ate everyone. Thanks. Kenny said, rolling her eyes. You asked. Ella said, crossing her arms. I'm not scared of no Wendigo. Ricky said, twirling a curl with her fingers. Come and get me baby. Ricky lifted the beer in her other hand at the woods and drank. Megan crossed her arms and raised a brow. Aren't you not supposed to say its name? She asked. Margaret nodded along with her. Oh come on, it's a load of shit. Ember said, finishing the rest of her drink. There's no such thing as a Wendigo. Kenny rolled her eyes and stood up, making her way out of the hot tub. I've got to pee. I don't have time for this shit. She grabbed her towel and made her way indoors, leaving wet footprints behind her. Spoil sport. Ricky said nonchalantly. So what is everyone wearing to Sarah's wedding? Margaret asked, changing the subject. I don't know, but I've got to look hot. Ella said. I'm thinking I might need to lose at least 10 pounds for this one dress I saw. You don't need to lose anything. Megan reassured her. You're plenty hot as is. Exactly. Margaret agreed. There's this one blue dress I thought about ordering Dash. Help. Kenny's voice broke through the trees and over the music, cutting Ricky off mid-sentence. What was that? Margaret asked. Turn off the music. Ember said. It's on Kenny's phone. Margaret said, the stress in her voice was obvious. A chill went down my spine as I glanced through the tree line, trying to make out any shape. Someone go turn that off. Ember said again, as another plea rang through the night. You go. Megan snapped. Ember huffed and stepped out, but I could see the fear on her face, though she tried to hide it. She quickly paused the music and we all froze. Help me. Please. Kenny's voice called again. She's just messing with us. Ricky said, but she couldn't really hide the shaking in her voice. The light is on upstairs. Margaret pointed to the top of the cabin. Our heads turned in sync, and then back to the woods. We know it's you, Kenny. Stop messing with us. Ember yelled. Don't engage with it. Ella snapped. What if it is something? It isn't. It's just her being a bitch. Ember said. Help me please. Kenny's voice called again. And then the voice screamed, a horrifying gut-wrenching scream. Oh my god. Megan yelled. Ella and I both shot up out of the hot tub. And then there was laughing. Oh my god. I can't believe you guys actually fell for that. Kenny called. She laughed loudly, and walked out from the tree line. That was absolutely hilarious. You should see your faces. There wasn't one of us that wasn't pissed. That wasn't funny. Margaret said, splashing the water for emphasis. You're so immature, we thought you were hurt. Megan said, clearly fuming. It's not safe to go back there. What if there had been an animal? Ella said, crossing her arms. Oh relax. You guys are literally incapable of having fun. I was just messing with you. Kenny said. It was clear that she had expected this joke to be praised. You're ridiculous. I said. My heart was in my throat, and my hands were still shaking. Come on. 
you guys need to lighten up. Kenny said, throwing her hands up. Without the music, and without any conversation, I noticed something I hadn't before. It was silent. There were no noises like there were earlier. No insects, no tree branches crackling. Nothing but silence. My head beat speed up again. Then we heard it. Help. It was faint, but very clearly Kenny's voice. Kenny give it up. It's not funny. Megan snapped. It's not me. I'm not saying anything. Kenny argued. Help. It called again, closer this time. My adrenaline was in full gear now, and my mind raced. If Wendigos were real, how many times had we said the name? Kenny had gone so far as to mock it. I felt like I would simultaneously vomit and pass out. Kenny. Ella said, staring at the tree line. Don't move, there's something back there. I followed Ella's line of sight, and sure enough there was a spot in the trees that was darker than everything else. As I watched, it shifted closer. Kenny froze, and from the slanted shaft of porch light illuminating her features, I could see her fear. You guys are messing with me. Trying to get me back, that's all. She said. Help me. The voice said. It was even closer, and distorted now. It sounded like Kenny's voice, but almost as if another voice was speaking at the same time. Help me. Kenny seriously. Walk slowly this way. Ella tried again. Stop trying to mess with me. Kenny said, but she was crying. The shape got closer to her. Kenny. Margaret called. Please. Kenny took one step in our direction, and then it was on her. It was huge and skinny like the descriptions had said. Its gray flesh sagged over its bones. It leapt at Kenny, and it was impossible to tell if it was screaming or if she was. Blood splashed towards the deck as we heard the sound of ripping flesh and breaking bones. Come on. I shouted, and scrambled to get out of the hot tub. We all made it through the back door, except for Margaret who was frozen in horror. Margaret. Ricky yelled. Get your ass in here. What the fuck are you doing? But Margaret either couldn't hear us or couldn't move. Margaret. I screamed. She stumbled back and fell in the hot tub. Then it was on her too. Her blood splashed inside the cabin before we could close the door. Lock it. Megan screamed. What the fuck is that going to do? Ember yelled back. But she locked it anyways. Ella followed the sentiment and ran to the front door and locked it too. What do we do now? Ella said. We've got to get our keys and get out of here. I said. We won't fit in my car. Ella we're going to have to take yours. Ella nodded, and ran to the counter. She searched in a flurry, but found nothing. I must have tossed them in my bag. She cried. She ran to her duffel bag tossed haphazardly on the couch and began tossing clothes and toiletries out. Help her look. Megan yelled. We all began searching, but her keys could not be found. Suddenly, we heard a large thump from the roof of the cabin, and the same scream from earlier. Fuck it will take mine. I shouted, grabbing my keys from the counter. We can't go out there, it's on the roof. Ember yelled. It will jump on us as soon as we're outside, we'll never make it. We can't stay here. Ricky yelled back. We have to try. Megan cut in, grabbing Ember by the arm. 
We can't leave them. Ember tried again. There's no other choice, let's go. I said. The thumping on the roof grew louder, like it was walking. The cabin shook under its weight. Then the thump was outside the front door. Oh my god it jumped. Megan whispered, body tensed. We can't go out there now, we'll be heading right towards it. Ember protested again. We're fucked. Ricky said, tears streaming down her face. We're going to fucking die here. The sound of crunching metal and shattered glass filled the cabin. Ella moved to the window and peeked through the blinds. Oh my god. It knocked over our cars. They're literally demolished. My stomach lurched and my head began to spin. I had to force myself to breathe. We can't leave. Megan whispered. We can't leave. Her voice was climbing, bordering on hysterics. This is bitch. I jumped into action, covering her mouth. It can hear us. Her eyes were wide as she nodded. Do we have any weapons, anything? Ricky asked. Did anyone check? There's a closet upstairs, I'll go look. Ember said. The front porch creaked, and we all froze, holding our breath. I could hear it breathing, loud and heavy. It was gurgling too. I couldn't panic. Now was absolutely not the time to panic. But I couldn't help it. My breaths were shallow and my heart was racing. It sniffed again, and stepped closer. The floorboards groaned again. Then Ella screamed. The Wendigo burst through the window, and glass went everywhere. Ella was screaming and the ripping sounds started up again. Go go go. Ember pushed Megan and I up the stairs. Ricky was close behind us, as we pounded up the stairs. Fuck. I heard Ricky scream and then a thump. I couldn't even turn around to see what happened to her. Megan ripped open one of the bedroom doors and dove in. Ember and I behind her. Ember closed the door and locked it. We heard Ricky's screams and the her gurgles. And the ripping sound, oh my god the ripping sound. I looked at Ember and Megan with tears in my eyes, as we listened to the Wendigo eat. How many of our friends had died tonight because of me? Because I was stupid enough to open my mouth. And we would be next. There was no way out. But then the idea came to me. There is a way to get rid of it. The same way I unintentionally brought it here. You understand right? Why I had to do this? Why I had to make you summon it? Every time you've thought its name while reading this. I'm sorry. I truly am, but we can't die this way. I won't let us. I hope you can forgive me. I hope you can understand. I won't let us die. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Second story. This story was shared by you slash Chgrook, so credits to him. I received an emergency alert while ice fishing. The emergency alert on my phone went off with a shrill noise, repeating three times and vibrating angrily, just as I was bringing the last of my belongings into the cabin. I took the device from my pocket and stared at it in disbelief for at least a minute before the realization set in that I would have to leave, only moments after arriving. My hands were shaking from the cold as I read through it again. Severe weather alert, heavy snowfall in the Frontenac region is expected to begin tomorrow. 60 to 80 centimeters of precipitation. Not good. I realized the roads would be impassable by this time the following day. That meant I would have to leave early the next morning to avoid being stuck on the roads in the blizzard. 
which subsequently meant zero ice fishing time for me. I'd be lucky to make it home before it started coming down in earnest. Moments later, messages started coming in from my three friends who had planned to join me. The group chat notification popped up on my phone and I opened it. Matt, did you see the emergency alert about the storm? I guess the trip's off. What a bunch of bullshit. Ted, OMFG. A generational storm is what they're calling it now. Looks like we'll have to postpone for a few weeks. I hope you didn't go through with your plan to go up a day early, Jay. Greg, no kidding. What are the chances this blizzard hits on our ice fishing weekend? I messaged back, saying I understood we'd have to reschedule. I told them that I'd made the trip up alone, accompanying the messages with forehead slapping emojis. It sucks that I'll be stuck up here alone, I thought to myself. My dog, Gibson, clawed at my leg and I smiled at her, feeling slightly reassured by her presence. Yeah, you're right, Gibby. I'm not completely alone. At least, I've got you here with me. After putting down a bowl of water and another containing kibble, my next priority was to start a fire in the small black stove at the center of the main living area. There was wood stacked up in a neat pile next to it and small bags containing kindling which we'd brought with us in the summer and left behind. At first glance it looked like a large enough stack, but I knew from experience I would need twice as much as it appeared to make it through the night, so I went outside to gather more from beneath the boathouse. The family cottage was a rustic one, to put it mildly. There was no running water, no electricity, and the cabin was poorly insulated. Perennially procrastinated repairs were needed in more than one place, including the floor beneath one bed which had partially collapsed, letting in a slight trickle of cold air from outside. It was drafty and I could hear the sounds of mice which had made their way in through the gaps, burrowing in the bedroom and finding their way into an old coat or a sleeping bag that someone had left behind. I sighed as I lit the kerosene lamps which were scattered on wobbly tables around the main living area. There was something about having vermin in the cottage that set me on edge. But at least Gibson's presence would keep them at a distance. After filling the place with a warm flickering glow from the half-dozen kerosene lamps, I felt a little better. There was reassurance in having fire, and I started working on making a big one in the stove that would keep me warm through the night. I loosely wadded up some newspaper and then stacked dry kindling on top, making a teepee. Over that, I added larger pieces of wood, until it was piled up to the ceiling of the small stove. Then I lit a strip of cardboard and held it up to the paper inside, catching it alight from several places, watching as it began to burn, and then flared up in a bright, white-orange glow. Holding my hands up to the fire, I watched it and warmed myself up. Eventually I took off my boots and my coat, the entire cottage gradually getting toasty. There was no sense unpacking, I thought taking a beer out of the cooler and opening it. I took a sip and couldn't help but grimace at the taste. I'd never tried the brand before and I'd picked it up on a recommendation. It was awful. And lukewarm to boot. Par for the course considering the trip so far. I took out my phone and watched Netflix while the beer went flat beside me. I lifted Gibson up onto the futon with me, so that she was off the floor, and close to the fire where it was warm. Eventually I got bored of office reruns and called it a night, adding another log to the fire and reminding myself to wake up in an hour to keep it going. Pulling the futon even closer to the stove so that it was as close to the fire as safety would allow, I curled up in my sleeping bag and drifted off into an uncomfortable slumber, constantly tossing and turning, trying to stay warm but not succeeding. I woke up to the sound of whining coming from Gibson trembling on the bed beside me. 
I was so cold that I was actually scared. My teeth were chattering uncontrollably and I realized a few hours had passed. The fire had gone out completely, reduced to mere embers at the base of the stove. I put on my jacket and blew hot breath onto my fingers, pulling Gibson closer to me. She was shaking badly as well. My hands were trembling as I put more newspaper and kindling onto the fire, blowing into the embers and hoping they would reignite. My lungs felt frozen and my heart was beating fast, my skin prickling with pins and needles turning into total numbness in my extremities. I'd never felt so cold in my life, and realized it was far beyond the weather forecasted on the news. It seemed like it was minus 30 degrees, and steadily dropping further. Terrified that I would not be able to get my body temperature back up, my mind started racing, thinking of worst-case scenarios. If I couldn't stop shaking pretty soon, it would be impossible to start a fire again. I recalled that my truck was just outside, and I could get in there and start it up, turning on the heat until I felt warm again. But the idea of getting out there and the truck refusing to start was too much to take. And considering the state of the beat-up old Ford, that seemed like a distinct possibility. So I continued stoking the fire, blowing on the precious few embers and adding more newspaper every so often, until a tiny flame had begun to grow. I held my shaking hands up to the measly fire and added pieces of kindling sparingly, one by one, terrified of it going out again. Pulling Gibson closer, we shared each other's warmth and I began to feel half-human again. A sound came from outside the cabin suddenly, startling me and causing me to jump, my heart skipping a beat then pounding faster and faster in my chest. A noise like fingernails being dragged across the siding could be heard from all around, echoing in the small space. Something was going from one end of the cottage to the other, attempting to get inside. Deep, guttural breathing could be heard, grunting and snorting, desperate as it scraped its talons against the boarded-up windows. Gibson began to whine, making high-pitched noises as she huddled closer to me, and I put my hand over her muzzle, muffling her sounds. Was it a bear? I wondered, and realized I was holding my breath. I thought about the holes in the flimsy facade of the cabin. The spot beneath the bed where mice were getting in. I thought about the broken screen door and the wooden one behind that which needed to be replaced, almost falling off its rusty hinges. The entire cottage felt so frail and insecure all of a sudden, as I heard the loud noise of whatever that thing was, breathing heavily just outside, trying to get in. Maybe it was too cold out there even for it. The ground shook with the weight of the creature as it made its way around the cabin. I was so focused on it that I didn't notice the fire going out again at first, as it fizzled down to embers. I continued holding my breath until it was gone. And then I relit the fire, my shaking hands barely able to get it going again. Once it was burning hot I didn't sleep anymore. I pulled Gibson close and the two of us stayed up all night watching the fire with weary eyes, taking occasional glances at the door. Even once we were both warm, we continued to shiver. When the sun came up I didn't notice at first. It was dark in the cottage one minute and then it was light. I blinked my eyes a few times and rolled out of bed, deciding I would waste no more time before leaving. I just hoped the bear or whatever had been outside the night before was gone. Gibson was scratching at the front door, asking to be let outside to pee, which told me it was probably safe now. In the light of the morning all that had happened seemed like a bad nightmare, and I told myself maybe it had been. Until I got outside and saw the claw marks which marred the exterior walls. Shuddering, I threw my belongings in the truck, doused the fire with too much water, and took one last look at the place. What a shitty weekend this turned out to be, I thought to myself. 
With more people around it was easier to keep the fire going, taking turns feeding it with wood so that everyone could sleep through the night. But it was frightening being up here by myself, even with Gibson by my side. I'd never done it before in the winter and I never would again. There were too many things that could go wrong. A freak snowstorm, a fallen tree blocking the road, getting stuck or going into a ditch, and those were just the beginning. I wanted to get out of here before any of those things happened. The truck didn't want to start at first. I turned the key in the ignition twice, hearing only a click and the absence of any engine noise. Cursing loudly, I checked to make sure I hadn't left an interior light on, or something which could have drained the battery. Satisfied there was still a charge, I tried one more time, and finally the old shitbox let out a cough and kicked into life. The engine began to sputter, before finally settling into a steady, rusted purr. All right, Gibson. Let's get out of here, I said, rubbing the dog's head and smiling as she blinked her eyes. She looked content in the front seat, happy to be back in the truck and out of the old cottage. There was a thin layer of snow on the gravel road, and the tires got moving easily enough. I looked up to see the sky was turning gray above me, and a few white flakes were just beginning to fall. The weather was making an early appearance. I turned on the radio and sure enough they said the same thing I was thinking. The storm would be arriving early. By noon, the highway would be a parking lot. Whiteout conditions. Be prepared to be trapped in your car. Have emergency supplies ready. My anxiety was through the roof as I went around a bend in the road. Hitting the gas, I came to the first big hill and went over it, seeing something strange up ahead as I came over the rise. Whatever it was, it was blocking the road. Massive and brown, the lumpy, furry shape got bigger as I pulled up in front of it. The bear which had been trying to get into my cottage the night before was dead. Lying in the middle of the gravel road and blocking it completely. At first I thought it had frozen to death. I got out of my truck to inspect it and was surprised to find there was a horrible smell coming from the carcass. It was a chemical smell, noxious and unpleasant, like some sort of factory waste. The snow had melted all around the beast, and blood and entrails were pooling around the far side. What the hell could do such a thing? Aren't bears at the top of the food chain? Alpha predators. Gibson was by my side, but she did not venture near the body. Usually she would be curious trying to sniff at something like that, but she stayed next to me, emitting a low growl. The road was completely blocked, I realized. There was no way out. Not unless I could move it. But no matter which way I attempted it, the giant body of the dead bear would not budge. It weighed a ton. There were large trees on either side of the road, too close to drive past. There was only one other way out, which was by driving across the frozen lake, and that way was risky. I hadn't been able to test the thickness of the ice yet. It would need to be nearly a foot deep for me to feel comfortable. But there was a clear way on and off the ice, if it came down to it. I got back in the truck and threw it in reverse, since there was nowhere to turn around. I felt sick to my stomach nervous with anticipation and fear, uncertain of how I was going to get out of here. Once back in front of the cottage, I got out of the truck and went down to the ice with my spot. Walking out onto the lake, I cleared a spot with my boot and began to dig with the sharpened metal rod. Satisfied that I'd found the bottom of the ice, I put the tape measure through the hole, hoping it would be close to a foot. Looking at the tape measure, my heart sank. The ice was barely 7 inches thick. Just below the minimum 8 inches where it would be safe to drive a vehicle across. And my truck was on the heavier side, 
I would feel more comfortable if it was a full foot thick or more. I pulled out my phone and checked for a signal, deciding it was time to call someone for help. Who I would call, I still wasn't sure, but I knew I couldn't get out of this jam by myself. Of course, I muttered out loud, seeing the signal bar was down to zero, and the words, N.O. Service, were printed across the top of the screen. Surely I would have gotten another severe weather alert by now, I realized, had it not been for the total lack of cell signal. Because snow was now being dumped down on me from above, and the sky had turned nearly black with the approaching storm. I typed out a message in the group chat, telling them my situation, hitting send regardless of the lack of signal. I knew from experience that it would go through eventually. I just hoped it would be sooner rather than later. Gibson let out a loud, high-pitched whine. Her tone rose in volume and she began to bark. Hi, persistent yips that were totally unlike her. She backed away, then let out a stream of urine, her hind legs trembling as she did. I looked up from my phone and saw what her eyes had spotted. Across the lake, something was moving in the trees. I saw fingers wrapping around a tree trunk, too high up, the nails too long and too sharp to be a person's. Whatever this giant was, it looked similar to a man, but it was massive. It peered out at me from between the boughs of trees, its head probably fifteen feet off the ground. Its skeletal limbs matched the monochromatic tone of the birches on either side of it, a gray, pale white shade. I couldn't distinguish the entire form of it in the shadows, but I could make out its eyes. They reflected back at me, catching the gray light coming through the clouds. And then I saw its mouth spread wider in a grin, teeth dripping blood, and it disappeared back into the darkness. The temperature felt like it had dropped to 30 below freezing again, as I began to shiver involuntarily and looked down to see Gibson was doing the same. There was only one choice. Only one place where we could go. The cabin. It was either that or risk plunging the truck into a frozen lake, attempting to drive across. We were on a small peninsula, surrounded by water on all sides, only one way in or out. And that way was blocked by the body of a giant brown bear. I took the dog back inside the cottage and locked the doors, taking uneasy glances outside through the cracks in the boarded up windows. What the hell was that thing in the forest? I asked myself over and over again. But no answer would come to mind. There was no creature I could think of that was fifteen feet tall, with reflective eyes, which stood on two legs like a man. Capable of disemboweling a full-grown bear. Capable of causing the temperature to plunge all around me. There was only one creature capable of that. And it wasn't supposed to exist. It was something from myth and from folklore, from legends that aren't supposed to be real. It's a wendigo, I said aloud, immediately regretting the words, as if saying them made it true. As if saying them would summon it. Wendigos are supernatural creatures born of Canadian First Nations folklore. They live in cold, remote places, and make people go mad merely through their presence. They thrive on the hunger, despair, and loneliness of their victims, who usually live in remote communities. They drive families apart, instilling urges of cannibalism in people and making them want to consume their own loved ones, during the lean, hard months of winter. They turn people into raving cannibals, driving away all their loved ones. And then, once you're alone, the Wendigo strikes. It either consumes you while you're still alive, tearing the flesh from your bones while you beg and scream, or it turns you into one of its own kind. But the Wendigo's greatest curse is that no matter how much flesh it consumes, it only grows hungrier. With every ounce of meat it takes in, it grows taller and more emaciated. 
Its hunger grows more insatiable with its height, until it is a towering beast with its head amongst the treetops as it roams the forest, constantly searching for its next meal. Gibson whimpered and burrowed her face into my armpit, as if hearing my inner thoughts. Trying to reassure her, I stroked her fur and told her it would be okay, although I had a feeling it wouldn't be. I tried to get the fire going again, but it was a fruitless effort. Everything inside the stove was damp and wet, and I scolded myself for dousing the fire with so much water. Still, I kept at it, knowing we might be stuck there for a while. Pretty soon the wind was howling and blowing outside and the snow was piling up in front of the door. I made a point of opening it every so often and clearing the front steps, knowing that I would need firewood, taking weary glances off into the forest across the lake as I did so. Finally I got the fire started, a low, guttering flame in the stove which wanted to go out all the time. Everything was damp but I kept feeding fresh kindling into it, nursing it until it kept going by itself. Hours passed as we waited to either run out of firewood or be attacked by the creature. We were running low on kindling and the sun was beginning to set, my stomach rumbling with hunger, when I felt something strange. The ground was suddenly shaking beneath my feet and I heard Gibson whining from beside me. What is it? girl. I asked, my voice catching in my throat as I realized the answer. It was the creature. It was back. The dining table began to rattle and bounce up and down as whatever was outside got closer, and I imagined the huge creature lifting the roof from the cabin like the cloche on a dish in a fancy restaurant, picking me up and eating me whole, like a wriggling shrimp. A second later there was a sound at the front door of metal being ripped and sheared as I realized the creature was making its way in. The screen door landed on the ground with a crash and then the wooden door was being torn from its hinges an instant later. Cold air rushed inside as Gibson began to let out shrill, panicked barks of terror. I heard the thing tearing apart the front entrance easily ripping apart the wood and making the doorway larger so that it could come inside. I tipped over the dining room table to use it as a barricade. I picked up a chair, the only weapon I could find nearby, thinking I would throw it at the thing's face to defend us, when I heard a strange noise from out front. It was a car horn honking. Someone had come to save me. I heard a loud ding and pulled out my phone and saw the green check mark beside my group chat message, indicating at some point it had gone through, at some brief moment when there'd been a gap in the clouds. Reading the one new received message on my phone, a hopeful smile spread across my face. Matt, you just had to skip town a day early and go ice fishing, didn't you? What the hell is that thing? Ted was yelling from outside. I don't know, but it's trying to get inside. Jay! Are you there? I shouted back that I was. There was a loud screech from outside which I realized had come from the monster. They'd actually wounded it somehow. I ran to the front door with Gibson and looked up, seeing the creature for the first time. It stood with its back to us, its head among the treetops, even taller than it had appeared at first. My friends had caught it off guard, but now it was fully aware of them, and it was going after them. The Wendigo was distracted by something in front of the cottage and I realized one of my friends had gotten out of the car and they were using themselves as bait, so that I could flee the cottage safely. They had driven across the ice with their lighter vehicle, just as I had hoped to do. I guessed that they'd also run into trouble moving the body of the giant bear which blocked the road. J. Ted screamed out the window, driving the car in circles on the ice, as if too terrified to stay still. I raced over to the car, slipping and sliding on the lake ice. It was Matt who was distracting the Wendigo, I realized, and I called for him to get away from the thing. It was too large and too fast. 
He didn't know what he was dealing with, but that was Matt. He was always the act first, think later type. Not only that, but he often put himself in harm's way for his friends. He turned to look at me and gave a thumbs up, his attention diverted from the creature for a split second too long. As Gibson and I got into the car, we heard his screams, and I looked to see the Wendigo had closed the distance in an instant, and was picking him up like an insect, turning him and taking bites from him in places. As Matt screamed for help, the creature peeled off his skin, exposing his skull as he ate his face. The calls for help turned to bubbling gurgles and wet, choked sounds and I nearly got out of the car to run after him, but Ted grabbed my wrist and pulled me back inside. You can't save him, he said with wet, red-rimmed eyes, and eventually I relented. We raced away across the icy lake, making a path through the blizzard, cutting a swath out of the fresh fallen snow on our way back to the main roads. For a while we debated what to do. Should we call the police? Our friend had just died after all. But we knew that if we did we would be considered suspects. And with no other reasonable explanation, they would pin the death on us. They would say we killed him. There was no box you could check on an official police report, citing a Wendigo attack, after all. Such things didn't exist. They were myths. Legends. As it turned out, we wouldn't have to worry about it. A message popped up from Matt on the group chat just a few minutes after we got home, and I had to tell myself it wasn't all just a nightmare, a hallucination from the cold and from lack of sleep and food. But Ted and Greg both told me I hadn't imagined it. What we saw was real. As much as I wish it wasn't. The three of us read the message on the group chat again and again. My heart was beating fast and a sick knot was growing in my stomach, bile rising in my throat that I could taste inside my mouth. Matt, hey guys, you really missed out on a feast. Ice fishing is just as much fun in a blizzard, if not more. Let's reschedule the trip for next weekend, okay? I'll be waiting for you here. As much as we don't want to go, we've resolved that we have to. We can't leave Matt like that. We have to help him. Next weekend we're making the trip back up there. Even if it kills us. Third story. This story was shared by you slash writing Somnia, so credits to him. I own a winter cabin in the forests of North Minnesota. Things are getting weird. September 24th, 21, 11 p.m., Recording 1. Me and my wife recently purchased a cabin deep in the forests of northern Minnesota. As recently as six months ago, in fact. I was never much of an outdoors person, growing up in a fairly large town in the southern part of Minnesota, I rarely saw the great outdoors, as I've heard many call it. My wife, however, is a country-loving woman, through and through. Having grown up miles from my hometown, surrounded by woods, and farmland her whole life, I don't think there's a single city slicker bone in her whole body. That being said, I somehow managed to convince her to buy a house with me in a small town, with the condition that, when finances allowed, we would purchase a cabin to stay in half of the year, and, well. Unfortunately for me, she held me to that promise. My wife decided that she wanted the six months spent in that cabin to be from October to March. Why anyone would choose to go farther north for the six coldest months of the year in what is essentially the fucking ice capital of the central United States is beyond me, but my wife insisted. Please, James. She had begged, you know my favorite seasons are fall and winter. And, she was right, I did know that. Growing up, she loved the leaves changing color in the fall, and the first snowfall was always magical for her. After some more insistent begging, 
I caved. Fine, but don't slide closer to me when you're freezing your ass off at night. I replied, a slight smile creeping across my lips. A large, childlike smile spread across Samantha's, or Sammy, as I affectionately called her, face, at my response. Her smile always seemed to brighten up the room, even since we were kids, it's always made my heart flutter. Better not smile like that up at the cabin. You might scare all the wildlife away, I smirked. Her smile turned into a half-offended, half-amused open-mouth smirk, as she smacked my arm. You asshole. I chuckled softly at the memory, as I drove down the winding dirt pathway through the woods. Sam turned her head, to look at me. What's so funny? She asked, cocking her eyebrow up slightly. Oh nothing, just laughing at myself. I said, flicking my eyes towards her. She rolled her eyes, as a hum reverberated up her throat. I moved my eyes back to the road, and immediately slammed on the brakes, sending us both into our seatbelts. Crossing the road, was a maimed deer, limping from one side to the other. Its stomach was torn open, leaving a trail. How it managed to keep moving was astounding. Sam and I looked at each other, and back at the deer, which was almost fully back within the trees, before it collapsed. What the hell? I muttered, turning and looking at her. She shrugged her shoulders, probably from Black Bear, they've been known to hunt deer. Do they hunt humans, too? I asked, half-joking. Not usually, am sure they'd make an exception for you though. Oh, whatever. I said, putting pressure on the gas again. We slowly rolled by the carcass, as we continued down the road. Once we were a couple meters away, I looked in my rear view mirror, and saw a flash of black, and the deer get slowly pulled into the brush. I always hated seeing wild animals getting killed, but such is nature, I suppose. We drove for another fifteen or so minutes, before we rolled up to the small, cozy cabin. It was technically about a week before October, when we decided we'd make our stay up here, but with it being our first time, we decided to come a week early, to get set up, and so I could scout around to find any possible work for our time up here. Since I was an electrician, I could work wherever I had my tools, and the supplies needed for the job and well, I had one of those things. My wife worked from home, working in the oil and gas industry, so that wasn't a problem for her. Oh, it's beautiful, she cooed, it's perfect. I must admit, even as someone who could give or take country living, it was a sight to behold. Maybe staying out here won't be so bad. We can dock later, come on, let's get our stuff unloaded. I said, beginning to unhitch the small moving trailer we brought up. She nodded, and opened the rear passenger door of the truck, pulling out our suitcases, and whatever else we had in the back. What's this? She asked, showing me a small recording device. Oh, Jace wanted me to bring that. Something for him to laugh at when we got back. I took the small device, and pocketed it. Jace was a good friend of ours, back from middle school. After I told him about the cabin he laughed. He told me to bring a recording device so I can document my endeavors of trying to survive out here, as he called it. The asshole. Instead of only documenting my misery, however. I had decided to make recordings once a month, or during important events. You, living in the woods. I'd be surprised to see you survive three weeks. He had said. Sam just smiled, of course he would. We both grabbed our respective bags, and brought them up to the front porch. I fished the key out of my back pocket that the realtor had given me upon purchase, and unlocked the door, 
opening it for the both of us to enter the cabin. We set our bags on the inside door, to prop it open, and made our way back into the trailer, to finish unloading, and to get our living situation in order. Once we had gotten the trailer and truck empty, moving the boxes into their respective rooms based on contents, we decided to call it a night. We have almost a full week to get everything situated. Samantha went to bed, after we exchanged kisses, and I decided to record this first entry. October 15, 21, 10.45 p.m. Recording 2 Well, it's been a couple weeks since my first recording. The cabin is set up, exactly how Sam wants it, Lord knows she's picky. Bordering OCD, honestly. She's gone to bed by now, I think that these recording sessions are going to have to be a nightly thing. Luckily she calls it a night a couple hours before I do. She generally wakes up a couple hours or so before me though, so I suppose it balances out. We haven't really done much since we came up here. I found work near me, which I will be starting on in the near future. Just a small job maintaining a warehouse's electrical systems, fixing anything that needs fixing, so that's nice. Sam is busy as ever with her job, so we both stay pretty busy during working hours. Last weekend, she decided she wanted to take advantage of the open country, and do some shooting, grabbing her old .22 she's had since she could first hold a gun and shoot properly, as well as the 30-06 her grandfather gave to her after he had passed. She's always been a pretty remarkable shot. I don't think there's a single target she can't hit in one round. I gave it my own shot, as well. I'm not quite to her level, but I can hit most targets within the first two rounds. Every once in a while, I might need to take a few more shots. My old man used to take me to the range once or twice a month. We like to make friendly competitions, to see who can hit the target the most before going through 15 rounds. Of course, she wins every time. Damn it. I had whispered under my breath, after my final round hit the ground to the side of the target. You're getting better. I could feel her smirk, you only missed five out of the shots you took. Yeah, yeah. Give me that 12 gauge and I'll hit every shot, I retorted, nodding in the direction of the bag it sat in. Well, yeah. It's hard to miss with one of those. She laughed. Exactly, I smiled, turning back to her. I flipped the gun to safety. Are we finished? She nodded her head, grabbing the small 22, and we walked back inside. That's more or less all that's gone on since we've arrived. I must admit. I am liking it up here a bit more than I had anticipated. Of course I'd still prefer it back at our other home, but, I could adjust to this. It's getting pretty late, and I should probably hit it for the night. I have to get to work in the morning. My next recording will probably be on my birthday. I'm sure Sam will have something planned, she always does. November 23rd, 21, 11.50 p.m., Recording 3 Sam threw me a very small surprise birthday party. My parents drove up here, and they're staying until the morning. I had to come out here to my truck to record this, as my parents are in our room, Sam and I are sleeping on a blow-up mattress in the living room. Her parents decided to make the drive back home, so they left some hours ago. It was nice to see them again, I haven't since, wait. What the fuck is that? November 24, 21, 12.04 AM, Recording 4 Holy fuck, that freaked me out. Some deer was sitting on the edge of the forest, just barely in view from the light given off of the house porch lights. It looked like just the skull, at first, I thought it was just sitting on a post, left as some sort of freaky house warming gift, but it turned its head, and disappeared. 
must have just been a trick of the light, or I'm just tired. I'm going to call it a night and go inside. It's getting pretty cold now, since it's getting later in the year, getting close to winter. November 29th, 21, 10.30, Recording 5. Well, Jace. You wanted me to record me trying to survive out here, so I'm going to make you listen to every damn minute that I have something to say. There's been a pretty foul smell, since the night that I saw that deer. I've smelled decaying animal before, and that's more or less what this is. I asked Sam about it, and she didn't have much to say. Animals die all the time. It could be that one recently did round the edge of the forest. It should go away after a couple days. I hope so. It's been driving me nuts. On a brighter note, my new job has been going fairly well. I've seen some pretty dumb shit working there, having to replace some wiring, conduits and what not, but for the most part, it's been easy and smooth, which is good. Easy money is the best money, as I'm sure you know. Sam's job has been the same as always. She's on that damn laptop almost all day. Internet out here is much more shoddy than back at the other home, so I often hear her cursing at the computer, which I find amusing. I've been seeing a large amount of wildlife charging through the yard, deer, I've even seen a couple moose. Big fuckers, I didn't even know we had them here. I don't know where there's been so many. Maybe they move when seasons change. I don't know. I don't know anything about animals. Like I said, I'm a city boy. They all looked like they were running from something, or trying to run all of them seem jacked up running janky, like their bones were all messed up, or that their skin just, didn't fit quite right. But they were too far away to tell exactly. Maybe a bear got to them all. Must have been some big ass bear to make a moose run, or fuck it up that bad. I didn't take moose as the type to run away from anything though. But, I don't know. Tomorrow I'm going to try to get Sam out of the cabin, so we can do something, maybe we'll go for a short hike through the forest. She might enjoy that. December 25th, 21, 11.45 PM, Recording 6. Merry Christmas, to all those listening to this. We came back down for the weekend. We're staying home until January 1st. It's quite nice being back. Nothing too interesting has happened since the last recording, so I won't have anything else to say until we get back. January 1st, 22, 4.30 PM, Recording 7. There is shit everywhere up here. We just pulled in front of the cabin, and it looks like someone came through and broke into the cabin. The door is off its hinges and just laying on the porch. There's garbage everywhere. Looks like whoever it was wrecked the enclosed trailer as well, it's all dented and smashed to hell, the boxes we used to move are torn to shreds all over the yard. Really, James? You have to record this now. Sam asked. Well, yeah, Sammy. I'm sure Jace, and whoever else is listening is going to want to hear about this. Fuck sake. She sighed. Just help me clean up. January 1st, 22, 10.40 PM, Recording 8. Well, I don't think Sam liked me recording our reaction. She got pretty upset about it. Guess I'm sleeping on the couch tonight. January 2nd, 22, 1.27 AM, Recording 9. I just woke up to weird noises, it sounds like, a person. Calling. I'm. It sounds like Sam, coming from outside. I'm walking to the door now. Fuck me it's cold. Holy shit, I think I see her. Why is she standing out here? Sam. 
Sammy. J. Amos. Sammy, what the fuck are you doing? J. Amos. It's cold as hell, hun. Come on back inside. James. What the hell are you doing, Sam said, wait, who the hell is that? January 2nd, 22, 1.35 a.m., recording 10. They're gone now. Sam came out from the bedroom, and was freaked the hell out, which honestly, I don't blame her for. I had her go get the 12 gauge to try to scare them off, but it wasn't until I shot the ground in front of them. After that they ran off, but not before screaming this almost, inhuman scream. It was definitely human, but it was just, so animalistic. The flash revealed them for half a second, and, they looked so. Wrong. Definitely some druggy high off their ass. I'm just glad they're gone now. Listening back, it seems so obvious it wasn't my Sam. I mean, the pitch is there, but it's so. Off. I'm just chalking that up to being tired. Sam seemingly forgave me for what happened earlier, because she's letting me get into bed after I'm done recording this, or maybe she's just scared, either way, I'm not complaining. That couch sucks. I don't know how well I'll be able to sleep tonight, with that freak out there, but we'll see. January 5th, 22, 10.45 p.m., Recording 11. I know that I said I'd only be doing these about once a month, but... Things keep getting weirder, almost, paranormal. I'm not opposed to the idea of ghosts, or spirits, and all that. My wife and I are Christian. Well, that's the easiest thing to call it, we don't exactly follow an organized religion, but you could call us Christian. We've been hearing weird noises at night. Both of our names being called, other. Strange noises. I don't quite know how to explain it. The smell of decay is back, too. Last night I saw that deer thing, I think it's a deer. I'm not so sure anymore, it might be someone in a deer mask, but it looked so. Decayed from where I was, and looking at it the smell of death was overwhelming. I'm honestly scared. I haven't told Sam yet, in fear of sounding insane to her, but, I'm ready to just go home. I'll see about bringing it up to her in the morning. There's a massive blizzard going on right now, and it's getting cold. I'm going to cozy up in bed with Sam, and get some sleep. January 6th, 22, 8.45 AM, Recording 12. She's gone. Fuck 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 f-u-c-k. Sam's just fucking gone. I woke up and, and she just wasn't here. The truck is still outside, it's covered in a blanket of snow, the door was wide open, it's freezing in here. I'm getting my boots on as I'm recording this. January 6th, 22, 9.30 AM, Recording 13. That fucker. I know they have something to do with this, the truck is inoperable, tires slashed, fucking engine won't even turn over, there's gas everywhere, like they punctured the gas tank. I don't know where Sam is either. I ran around out there, calling her name, trying to find her. I kept hearing my name, the same fucking voice from the other night. I swear, when I get my hands on these freaks. January 9th, 22, 6.30 p.m., Recording 14. Sam still hasn't come back, and I've been searching for the last three days. I called the nearest police station, they sent out search parties, but nothing. I listened back to the recording, and the voice isn't the same. It, it actually sounds like her, but, it's. It's wrong, it's so, so wrong. I don't know what else I can do. It smelled like death in that damn forest, everywhere. Please. I hope that wasn't Sam. 
And I keep hearing that fucking voice, I can hear it now, outside. I'm going out there with the 12 gauge, and I'm fucking whoever is doing this up. Consequences B. Holy fuck, holy fuck. What the fuck? That's not. What the fuck is that? January 12th, 22, 5.45 p.m., recording 16. Sam's dead, she has to be. And I'm in here, sitting like a fucking coward. The doors are boarded up, the windows too. I, yesterday I saw a big deer thing, but, it was not a fucking deer. It was massive, seven, eight feet tall. Gangly, and the smell, holy shit the smell. It was awful. I've spent the last day reading, and, I came across something called the Wendigo. Some, old native legend. Said to have insatiable hunger. But it couldn't have been a Wendigo that night. It was a person I saw, I know it. It had to be. They came back last night, I heard it calling my name, trying to imitate my wife. My poor wife. We should have stayed home. Wendigos can't look like people, they can sound like them, sure, but not look. What the fuck was that? I've also come across skinwalkers. From what I know, they can't copy whatever they're trying to imitate perfectly, which could explain the weird movements, and the messed up face. But that has to be fake right? But, the Wendigo shouldn't exist either. Plus, skinwalkers surely would imitate more than one thing. Right? Not just one. The animals. The animals I kept seeing running through the yard, they were all messed up too. Oh, shit. Thanks a lot for watching the video till the end, subscribe to our channel horror in detail. Drop your opinion slash suggestions in the comments section, and like the video as it helps with the YouTube algorithm.